Hi everyone, and welcome back to my channel. Today, I'd like to dive into a pet project of mine, a ROM compiler for the Sky130 process. It's something I've been working on and off for some time, but since it's rapidly approaching a state where I can actually tape out some silicon, I thought it'd be a good time to present it a bit more widely. But before I go any deeper into what I've done, I have to give a bit of context. What is Sky130? What's a ROM compiler, and why would you want one? Sky120 is a process node that is a given technology to make chips. The particularity of Sky120 is that all of the information required to build designs for it, also known as the process design kit, is freely available without having to sign NDA or any such nonsense. I've actually made a live stream on my initial exploration into the PDK back when it was first released. Feel free to go check that out. This process is also very well supported by open source tools, so no need for expensive software. Last but not least, there are also a couple of affordable options to have your design manufactured and get actual chips back. If you're interested in that, check out Tiny Tapeout and or eFabless Chip Ignite program depending on your available budget and area requirement. I'll put links down below. What's a ROM compiler? ROM, as you most likely know, stands for read-only memory, that is, memory where the content is fixed. In this context, it's fixed when you design the chip. It can be useful for a lot of things. If you have some video output, you might need a font or some icons. If you're making a CPU, maybe you need some microcode for it, or a boot ROM. If you need to do some computation, maybe you need a sign table. So yeah, I think we can generally agree that ROM are useful. And in most of these cases, you're happy to use ROMs because the data doesn't need to change, and ROM will have much better density than any other form of storage. A ROM compiler is then just a piece of software that takes your ROM content and generates a macro that you can integrate into your larger design. The macro size and external interface are also independent of the ROM content, meaning you can easily update it without having to change anything else in your project. So these are the main reasons why you would want one. Let's have a look at the options currently available at the time of making this video if you want to integrate some ROM into your project. The first one is you don't do anything special. You just describe your ROM in HDL like so and let the synthesis tool do its best to generate some logic that will implement it using whatever standard cell library you're targeting. The advantage of this is that it's that simple for the designer, here, you. Because you're not doing anything special compared to the rest of your logic in your design. And for small ROMs, it might actually be the best option. There are, however, a few serious downsides to this approach. The biggest one is that the results are highly dependent on the ROM content. If there is a lot of structure in there, the synthesis tool might be able to optimize a lot and you get small area and great speed. But if later on you need to change the content of your ROM, you might get a very bad surprise. Because the ROM is an integral part of your wall design, you also need to reboot everything every time you want to change the content. And the opposite is true as well. When you change something in your design, the ROM part will get rebuilt and that can contribute a lot to build time and thus iteration time. You can of course isolate the ROM part in a sub-macro, but that also hurts density. And you need to make it large enough so that it will fit no matter what the ROM content is. To get a rough idea of what is achievable, I took some random content and tried to build a ROM that fits into a 160 by 110 micron area, which coincidentally happens to be the area of a single tiny tape out tie. Despite a lot of trial and error with size and density, I couldn't get all the way to an 8 kilobits ROM, and I had to limit this test to only 7 kilobits. The area used by the standard cells is only about 7,800 square micron, but the routing couldn't complete until I lowered the density all the way down to 55%. That gives us a storage density of about 2 square micron per bit. It isn't great. It also took more than 30 minutes to build. It's not terrible, but adding 30 minutes to your iteration time is not something that you can neglect. What other options do we have? In 2023, a student wrote a ROM compiler for Sky130 for his bachelor thesis. The compiler, named OpenROM, was integrated into the larger OpenRAM framework. I know the naming is a bit confusing, but OpenRAM is a larger project usually dedicated to the creation of SRAM arrays. But in this case, it can also be used to create a ROM macro. So this all sounds great, right? A ROM compiler already exists for Sky130, so that means I don't have anything to do. Unfortunately, not quite, which you should probably have expected or this video wouldn't exist. The first issue is that the ROM uses a NAND architecture. I won't go into the detail now of what that really means, but the advantages are usually a higher bit density at the cost of speed. And reading through the page of thesis text, it looks like indeed speed was sacrificed, with access times ranging from several tens of nanoseconds for small sizes like 8 kilobits to upward of 400 nanoseconds for 32 kilobits ROM. And 32 kilobits is really not that large a size, and I would definitely consider it on target. 
The second issue is that despite being a NAND architecture, the density doesn't look all that great either. As a test subject, I generated an 8 kilobits ROM, 1024 by 8 bits, and looked at the resulting GDS. Looking at the total area used, even when excluding the power rings, it's roughly 172 micron by 122 micron. That's more than 2.5 square micron per bit, which is worse than the ROM simply built out of standard cell. If you zoom in to see the ROM bit cell, it's actually only about a micron by a micron, which, although not exceptionally small, is not terrible. The problem mostly comes from all the support periphery circuitry, which occupies a lot of the area. To be fair, they do include some register flip-flops on the input address lines, however those don't represent a major contribution to the area. The final and pretty much fatal issue of Open ROM is that the generated macro doesn't actually meet the DSC rules, meaning you can't get it manufactured. I've run both the front end of the line and back end of the line of DLC decks on the resulting GDS, and there are a lot of errors. Some with fixes that wouldn't be too hard to do by hand, but some others that are much more tricky to solve. You can see here a lot of violation in the implant mask and SDM PSDM, in the N wells, and a bunch of other violations in the front end of the line checks. And here in the BOL checks, you can see local interconnect and metal one layer violations. I'm not sure if those had always been present or if the code just bit rotted since it was first integrated, but as it stands at the time of making this video, it's not a viable option. My guess is that it was just a proof of concept written just for the thesis and nothing more. And that brings me to my project and why I thought writing a new ROM compiler would be a good idea. First, let's define some design targets and guidelines. The first target is to be as dense as possible. The goal here is to fit as much data as possible into the given area. That means, of course, having a small bit cell, but also a low overhead for all the required peripheral circuitry. As we saw with Open ROM, that latter part can be quite significant. Size-wise, I'm focusing on ROMs between 1 kilobits and 32 kilobits. It doesn't mean I'm planning to explicitly limit size to those bounds, but some of my other constraints might not apply if you go beyond those sizes. Below 1 kilobits, the overhead of the peripheral circuitry might become larger than you would want, and using a different ROM architecture or simply rely on the synthesis tool might be a better option. Above 32 kilobits, with my expected density, the parasitics might become a bit large, meaning speed will suffer. At that point, splitting the ROM into several smaller banks might be beneficial. Speed-wise, I think targeting 100 MHz, or about 10 nanosecond access time, is a good target. It won't need too fancy techniques and should match pretty well the kind of speed you can hope to achieve on the Sky130 HD standard cell library. I do want to mention a few things that I'm not going to do or care about. I will not be using anti-DSC waivers. It's not uncommon for memories and such very repetitive arrays to be very optimized in collaboration with the fab to waive some of the DLC rules and or applying special optical proximity correction to the masks to allow for smaller features. Here, I want to obey the normal DLC rules. First, because I don't have any relation with the fab, so it's just not an option to begin with. And also because I'm writing this compiler to be usable on tiny tape out, where this kind of waiver would cause all kinds of issues at every tape out, and I just don't want to deal with that. Part of obeying the DRC rules also means trying to stay within the density targets by design. A lot of layers like active diffusion, poly, all the metal layers and such have specific density target ranges. So there's a minimum and maximum percentage of it that has to be filled. In more classic designs, you can usually use fill patterns in unused area to meet those targets. However, here the design will be dense, so much so that there won't be any space for fill pattern. And that means that our design elements, especially the bit cell, which are the patterned over a large area, has to meet those density targets by design. And as a consequence of targeting mostly time tape out and eFabless chip ignite, is that I'm not trying to make a masked ROM. Masked ROMs are designed so that you can modify the content of the ROM by modifying very few of the manufacturing masks, often just one. And it's also sometimes built in a way that the masks doing the actual content programming is one of the latest steps in the process, the so-called contact program ROM. This allows to prepare wafer early and have a quick turnaround when changing the ROM content. But the advantages provided by such methods are really only applicable when you build full wafers of your chips. Here, I intend it to be used on MPW services where masks are shared between a lot of users. So changing the ROM content by only redoing one of the manufacturing masks is not an option anyway. I also don't plan on including any registers, at least to start with. 
So the design will be pretty much combinatorial. There will be some sequential aspects that we might use, things like pre-charging, but we'll discuss that when we come to it. I think that's it for the design goals. We'll see at the end how it turned out. Here's a quick sneak peek into my design and what it looks like at the moment. It's not quite 100% finished yet, so you can probably spot some unconnected parts. For the general ROM style, I went with a no ROM. Here's a quick diagram of what it looks like. You can see that at each ROM location, you have a single NMOS transistor, and whether the transistor is present or absent is how you program the content of the ROM. Each of those transistors is independently connected to word select lines and bit lines. This is in opposition to NAND style ROM where the programming transistors are chained one after the other. This usually allows for greater density because no ROMs you often end up limited by the density of the contacts rather than the density of the transistors. The downside of those long chain of transistors is speed. That's why here I opted for no style and also because I had some nice tricks in mind on how to alleviate the contact density issue. On the bottom you can see all the word line selection circuitry which is in charge of decoding the address and activating the right word line. On the left side are the bit line muxing and output drivers. Usually you have much more bit lines than your ROM has output bits, so you need to mux them. Imagine 8 kilobits ROM, 1024 by 8 bits. If you only had 8 bit lines, you'd have 1024 word lines. The dimension of the macro would be very skewed. So instead, you make, for instance, 64 word lines of 128 bits, and then you reduce those 128 bits down to 8 bits with a final 16 to 1 mux using some of the address bits. Finally, this little part there contains the select line drivers. It's basically taking the address bits, buffering them, and distributing them around, mostly to control the word line and the bit line muxes. And that will be it for this episode. It was mostly an introduction into the goal of this project and its general architecture. In future parts of this series, we'll take a deeper dive into each of the components of the design, starting with the design of the bit cell itself in the very next episode. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. In the meantime, like the video if you thought it was interesting, leave a comment if you have any feedback or a question, and I will see you in the next one.